begin. <laughs> All right, let's begin. Welcome to the. Okay. okay. Welcome to the Sussex Development Lecture Series, uh, and welcome to those who are joining us online, uh, who will hopefully engage with the conversation and give us questions. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Robert van Niekerk, who will be delivering tonight's talk. He is the Matthew Guniwe Chair of Social Policy and the Director of the Social Institute of Social and Economic Research at Rhodes University. He is also a Senior Research Visiting Fellow at the Center for International Education at, at this university. We are very pleased to have him here because he's been working for many, many years in the area of social policy and in particular around policies aimed at overcoming inequality and developing social rights of citizenship and the good society and looking at the factors that account for the success and failure in policy implementation. In particular, he's focused a lot of his energies on looking at social policy, its institutional history, ideologies and understandings in South Africa, but also Cuba. He's also been working extensively and involved in the debates around decolonization, particularly at Rhodes University, and he'll tell you more about that. So I'm very pleased that he's joined us and he's agreed to give tonight's lecture. He will speak for around, I guess, 45 minutes, after which I'll open it up for questions, both from the audience here and to those who are engaging with this conversation online. So without much further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Robert van Nieker to deliver the talk, which is entitled Decolonization and the Transformation of Higher Education in South Africa, the case of Rhodes University. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Yusuf, Prof. Yusuf Sayed, for that kind introduction. I also want to thank Prof. Mario Novelli, the Director of the Center for International Education, and the idea is for inviting me to present my thoughts on decolonization and transformation of higher education in South Africa, drawing on the case of my university, Rhodes University. In this talk, I would like to provide a narrative account of some of the key issues as I see it around decolonization, which emerged in the period of the student protests since 2015 at Rhodes University. The process by, the way, by which the protests unfolded in relation to decolonization of the institution. And I focus firstly though on Rhodes University as an historically colonial institution. And this hopefully provides a context for the discussion on, on and the imperatives around decolonizing the institution. So I think one can't fully understand the imperative to decolonize the institution if one doesn't have a fuller sense of the flavor of the institution as a colonized institution or historically colonial institution. And I focus for the purpose of this talk on the key actor, the students, and how they frame the issue of decolonization, how this was raised, and how this was resolved or not. And then I conclude with an observation on the decolonization debate in relation to ideals of emancipation drawing on the recent experience of the university. So firstly, a description of Rhodes University. Rhodes University was founded in 1904 as the smallest of the four historically white English-speaking universities in South Africa, described in a later period as open universities. And this is the era of, the, of apartheid. The other three being the University of Advertisrand, the University of Cape Town, and the University of Natal. By open is meant that these white English-speaking universities were more liberal, quote-unquote, in their outlook than those predominantly Afrikaans-speaking universities which allowed themselves to be unmediated conveyor belts for the dominant ideology of apartheid. In his excellent recently published book on the political and intellectual and cultural history of Rhodes, and Rhodes University, and which I draw on heavily here, Professor Paul Malam identifies the establishment of Rhodes College, later university in 1904, as an education project which was unequivocally linked to sustaining and reproducing an ethos of British imperialism in the colonies, 
through all facets of its symbolism, pedagogical approach, and institutional, institutional culture, including a statue of Rhodes displayed prominently. Its original Founders' Day was proposed firstly, for, for example, as quote-unquote Empire Day on the 24th of May, but this was defeated by the First Council of the University in favor of another date, 12th of September, a day which had nothing to do with the founding of the university, but celebrated the establishment of white domination or settlement, if you will, in the then Rhodesia, and as a homage as well to the arch imperialist and colonial racist Cecil John Rhodes, who had died two years before in 1902. The naming of the university in favor of Rhodes had no direct connection with the imperialist himself, as he had already passed away, but was an attempt to curry favor with the Rhodes Trust to be a major financial benefactor towards the establishment of the university. While Rhodes had no role or interest in establishing the university, his views are pithily recorded in relation to the establishment of the University of Cape Town, where he was a prominent figure joking to the imperial architect Herbert Baker when he said he meant to build the university out of the Kaffir's stomach. And of course, Kaffir here is meant as a pejorative, crude, racist epithet to describe black people. So this is the mindset of Rhodes. The evidence suggests further that Rhodes historically and on these imperial foundations was in subsequent generations by far the most conservative of the ostensibly quote-unquote open and liberal universities, colluding with the apartheid regime since 1948 in amongst other maintaining racially segregated residences far longer than the other of the liberal white universities, awarding honorary doctorates to the architects of apartheid and most infamously, perhaps, excluding Steve Biko, the venerated black liberation hero, who attended a student meeting at Rhodes University in 1968 with black students from using the dormitory on the university, which was reserved for white students, and which then led to the walkout by Biko with other visiting black students from Rhodes University's English liberal, predominantly white National Union of South African Students, and Beaker's formation of the independent, black consciousness-inspired South African student organization. The staffing structure at Rhodes University in the 1950s, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s was white-dominated and racially segregated, consisting exclusively of white academics and a white, and a white male-dominated professoriate, a white male-dominated administration, with the lower level support staff workers undertaking menial work almost exclusively being black. Within this white male dominated professoriate in the period between the 1980s and 1990s, leading up to the democratic transition in 1994, there was small progressive minority of white academics who upheld an unequivocal anti-apartheid commitment, while the overwhelming majority of the white academic and administrative staff however, were largely holding a docile position in relation to the apartheid status quo. In this milieu, Rose University, a mainly residence-based university, cultivated an enviable, an enviable reputation for offering the best Anglo-centric undergraduate teaching of all South African university institutions and an institution which produced fine published scholarship, again in an almost exclusively Anglo-centric tradition. <clears throat> its symbols, however, were one that consistently maintained continuity with its original colonial imperative. A statue of Cecil John Rhodes displayed prominently in the university and the architecture, art, and all institutional manifestations and cultural mores contoured around the colonial and Anglo-centric imperial worldview to the eclipse of anything that suggested the university was located in an African political and cultural setting. So the student protests of 2015 and 2016 around the decolonization imperative must be set against this historical narrative of the university's colonial origins and ethos if we are to better understand the scale of alienation of black students and the mobilization around the decolonization imperative. The introduction to the student experience, it must be recorded for, at, 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 as, late, that as late as 1975, and despite the limited relaxation of party laws preventing access of black students to the, white <laughs> to the white designated universities, Rhodes University only recorded an enrollment of six plus black 
graduate post uh, black postgraduate students by 1976. The experience of black students in this time is reflected in the observations of one black student, now prominent progressive journalist and writer, Zubaydah Jaffa, who recorded the views of a white housemate in an official university residence that she occupied. And she, and she says, and I quote, heading from a school in Pretoria, she said, this is the, the student, the white student, that she was shocked and could not understand why we as black students were at Rhodes. We were five black girls in the house with her, and she said she had not expected this. She had been told that we have a low IQ and so could not understand how it was possible that we were sharing a residence with her. As pointed out by Paul Malam, and the quote from whose book I, I, I recorded this, this uh, irony was that the white student was only studying for diploma, having not qualified for degree courses, while the minority black students such as Zubaydah Jaffa were all registered for degrees, some for advanced degrees. To suggest, however, that this period represented an unmediated, un, an unmediated experience of educational colonialism would not be correct. The period of the 1980s leading up to the 1990s and the 1994 democratic elections saw an explosion of anti-apartheid activity at Rhodes University led by the black student movement and progressive white academic staff and students organized in the National Union of South African Students. These struggles were focused, however, on the overthrow of apartheid and its manifestation in the system of education and done in solidarity with the oppressed black communities experiencing severe police and army repression and the, and the struggle to create a democratic state. Less focus per se was focused on the decolonization of Rhodes University as an institution, although there was a rich engagement with alternative pedagogies of learning and teaching, foremost amongst which was the Brazilian radical educationist Paulo Freire and the African essayist, essayist and writer Ngugu Wationgo, who featured prominently in this time. While radically opening up the space for alternative ideas and led by a minority of left-wing and progressive liberal academics, this, however, had little fundamental impact on the institutional culture of Rhodes University, which remained a predominantly white, male-dominated university with a formerly apolitical institutional stance. With the inauguration of the first black vice-chancellor, Salim Badat, in 2006, and the first black vice-chancellor, Jake Scherville, both prominent progressive intellectual scholars and higher education administrators, the white dominance in the institutional culture was to be fundamentally interrogated. The new vice chancellor set in place a program of scholarly engagement on the institutional culture and its colonial and alienating experience for black students and staff, culminating in a public apology by the university for its shameful complicity with the system of apartheid and a specific apology for excluding Steve Biko from the whites only residence in 1968. He also embarked on a determined program of deracializing the staff complement, determinedly recruiting black academic staff to the professoriate and lower levels, and appointing a black African senior administrator as, de as deputy vice chancellor of academic affairs, Professor Sizwe Mabazella, who went on to become the current vice chancellor. But that also systematically engaged with the support staff workers, student bodies, and academics on the imperatives to transform the institution to make it demographically representative and intellectually relevant to the experience of all students, in particular black students, and he sought to achieve this through democratic delib deliberation within the scholarly community rather than the imposition of policy from above. His academic leadership sought to simultaneously retain and improve Rhodes University's reputation as the leading institution of scholarship and teaching in the country while confronting imperatives of transformation. And he was not fearful of engaging robustly on this achievement and reconciling these agendas. Uh, advances were achieved on changing the demographic profile towards more black academic and administrative staff and Rhodes retained its position as a country-leading institution of scholarship and teaching. The tactical compromise Badat made, though, was to retain remnants of the old administration, who sust which sustained institutional continuity in the, in the administration, but who did not share the extent and urgency, urgency of Badat's leadership drive to transform the institution. Having opened up the space, the issue was that given the still predominantly white-controlled Senate and Council, and faculty could Rhodes transform through the preferred route of democratic and collegial engagement 
when the majority veto lie with those white academics and administrators who benefited from the status quo. Furthermore, was the, space, was the pace of decolonization and transformation established by, by Badat as a deliberative project of educational change sustainable with the increased transformation of the student body to black students, many from impoverished social conditions and dependent on state bursaries, and who by 2012 constituted 60% of the total Rose University student body. How was this to be simultaneously reconciled with the continued white dominance of the academic and administrative structures and contrasted with the support staff structures of workers, the latter of whom were predominantly black? These issues were come to the fore explosively in 2015, placing the decolonization imperative at the forefront of the university. The catalyst for this was a flinging of feces at the statue of Cecil John Rhodes by a black student, Chumani Maxwelli, at the University of Cape Town. This act of symbolic contempt for relic of colonialism, described by Maxwelli as an expression of black pain at the consequences of colonial plunder on the black body, was to lead to the establishment of the Rhodes Must Fall movement, which sought reaffirmation of blackness and black identity, culture, and black intellectual thought in university institutions which were found to reify whiteness and a Eurocentric, a Eurocentric worldview. From the earliest stages of the student-led movement for decolonization, it was clear that the imperatives for decolonization as an idea expressing and affirming black cultural and intellectual identities was also underpinned and informed by the structural position of mainly poor black students in wealthy, middle-class-centered, white, elite academic institutions. Class, in other words, was a motive force underpinning the, expression, the expressions of decolonizing protest, even if it was claimed and expressed in terms of identity. At Rhodes University, this was most visibly expressed in the occupation of the Senate room in the administration building by the Rhodes Black Student Movement over the issue of poorest students having to pay a fee for use of university accommodation in the, in the vacation period in a context where poorer black students lack the means to make this additional payment for use of the university accommodation and where it was also not cost effective to pay for transport to return to the often remote rural areas that many of these poorer students lived in. The black student movement, students' occupation of the, of the council building was preceded by a packed meeting from which a memorandum emerged demanding that the council change the name of the institution from the colonial plunderer Cecil John Rhodes, that it transformed the curriculum to include black revolutionary thinkers and intellectuals, and it transformed the Eurocentric institutional culture of the university. The university's response was to issue a circular saying that it would address transformation issues including changing the social and demographic composition of the student and staff, the curriculum, the university's visual culture, ceremonies, rituals and traditions, and the name of the university and its buildings. So to some extent, this was a restatement of a process that had already been established under the previous vice chancellor. What had changed was the urgency with which this was needed to be addressed prompted by the student mobilization as well as its depth and its scale. The agenda for addressing these concerns had been re-established, but now was driven by the imperative of the black student movement and not the university. The black student movement cohered around an ideological affiliation with the works of Algerian revolutionary Franz Fanon and an iconic black consciousness leader, Steve Biko. Significant elements of this emerging black student movement was that it had a rotating leadership and therefore did not consist of one leadership center, that women students played a very prominent role in articulating the ideas of the movement and providing tactical and strategic leadership, and that affirmation of LBGTI sexual identities and opposition to heteronormativity was raised at the, various, at the very earliest stage as a central concern in forming political identity within the student movement and that social media such as Facebook performed a central role as a mobilizing and organizational tool within the movement. The new Vice Chancellor Siswe Mabazella, in response to this mobilization, indicated that the issues raised around changing the name of the university needed to be resolved through democratic and deliberative debate and discussion 
and a task team was established to examine the issue and canvass the views of the, of the wider section of the university on the changing of the name from Rhodes. The task team was disbanded, however, due to practical considerations, and this process has now been superseded by a statutory institutional forum which was similarly tasked with canvassing opinion widely on the name change amongst the different constituencies. In the, interst in the interstices, however, the university's name has now been de facto delegitimated by the black student movement and radical academic and administrative staff aligned to this movement who now refer to the university as UCA. So that's U-C-K-A-R, meaning the university currently known as Rhodes. <laughs> the black student movement, meanwhile, having principally mobilized around the issue of accommodation, continued to occupy the council chambers for a 37-day period after which they left. They were to see the demands acceded to by the vice chancellor with illegible poor students provided with cost-free accommodation at the expense of the university. Significantly, this was not accepted as a victory by the students, however, as they, refu they refused the basis under which eligibility was to be determined for these students to be offered accommodation, which was through them having to undergo a means test. The students rejected the means test as they saw it as having to quote-unquote unquote, perform their poverty in order to access university resources and which they further viewed as demeaning and degrading. Whether advertently or inadvertently, the students had shifted the discourse from an ameliorationist discourse focused on the poor to a discourse focused on social exclusion and alienation. Simultaneously with demands for changing the curriculum, the black student movement questioned the legitimation of the untransformed university spaces by removing a mural in the council chambers prepared by black women members of a local art project in an area called Kiskama, a black community in the Eastern Cape province. Instead, they replaced this community-based mural in the council chamber with photocopies of black political and cultural figures ranging from the bikini Faso revolutionary Thomas Sankara to the multi-billionaire singer Beyonce. The symbolism here is not neutral and requires further reflection, perhaps. How is it possible that a socialist and revolutionary nationalist such as Thomas Sankara, who had a clearly articulated class-based approach to social change, is reconcilable with a gifted R&B singer of pop music affirming of the black experience, but who in no way challenges the system of capitalism, indeed whose husband Jay Zid is seen as a foremost proponent of the bling-bling, aspirationist, and consumerist culture that m many black students have no possibility of experiencing. The answer may lie in the reconciliation of the radical nationalist discourse on the part of the decolonization movement with an identity politics that eschews class as the principal underpinning of black student political organization. So my presentation has tried to contrast the challenges of decolonization in the context of the past and how the challenges are being addressed by the present black student movement. There is an element of this decolonization agenda that is linked to the protests around free education and the link being that black students cannot access institutions of higher education if they are required to pay prohibitive fees that historically have allowed access to higher education to white students, but not black students. The fees must fall protests have been led unevenly by a multi-class and non-racial to some extent alliance of fees must fall students in favor of decolonization of higher education, reference again around fanon and black consciousness, and against access prohibiting educational fees. This aligned revolt has undoubtedly opened up a new politics of protest in which affirmation of racial and sexual identities is also again a signal feature. The possibility of such student politics in reframing the terms in which class and race are discussed in relation to emancipatory anti-racist agendas have been clearly if very unevenly established. It is too early to tell though whether such developments are an indication of a deeper trajectory aimed at challenging the capitalist status quo, distinctive from an earlier phase of protest and mobilization under the Rose Must Fall banner, 
or whether it can be accommodated within a bourgeois nationalist project if its immediate demands are met. What is interesting, though, in class terms is an entirely unclaimed initial social democratic impetus to the demand for free education. The student opposition movement was constructed as a multi-class and, to some extent, again, a non-racial alliance of students campaigning for universalized higher education, regardless, at least initially, of the differentiated class position of the constituent elements of that alliance and their quote-unquote ability to pay higher education fees. While the position of this alliance as transcendent of class relationships should not be overstated, it did, however, point to the possibilities of more or less contingent political alliances that could be forged around the universalization of a public good with a substantive redistributive imperative of strategic value to the working class and the poor, albeit a minority until earlier stages of education are themselves reformed. The alliance's objective of securing universal free education was later reframed, however, as a more selective demand for free education for working class and poor students only, with complicated sliding scales of fees linked to the ability to pay, thereby reinserting differentiation through higher education between middle class, working class, and poor students. This paradoxically reduced a strategic debate on universalism and strategies to achieve it to the anti-social citizenship selective discourse of means testing the latter referred to by, purest, by poorer students as having, and I've mentioned this before, to quote-unquote perform their poverty, describing how they experienced being required to demonstrate how they did or did not meet the eligibility criteria for state's funded support for higher education. <coughs> this speaks to some degree to the extent to which and the ways in which the goals of redistributive universalism, social citizenship, etc., have simply slipped off the agenda of the post-apartheid condition to a degree and with an ease that would have been unimaginable at the time of the political transition in 1994. So I'd like to conclude my presentation with an observation by the radical Marxist Professor Issa Shifji. Reflecting on his experience of the decolonization movement at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, he raised some trenchant concerns he said that in the case of the student movement in Dar es Salaam, the decolonization imperative was explicitly linked to analytic frameworks located in class, anti-imperialism, and anti-neoliberalism. The objective of decolonization was therefore linked to a wider agenda of social emancipation. His concerns in his observations on South, Af South Africa was that these analytic frameworks were either not engaged with or were too embedded to be meaningful, and he feared that the decolonization project could therefore easily be transformed into a narrow project of nationalism that replaced the old order of colonial symbolism with a new nationalist order, but still retaining the underlying structures of class and capitalist inequality. It is a fear that I share with Shifty that the decolonization imperative could replace one regime of representation with a new regime, culturally more identifiable and politically more legitimate, uh, and a politically more legitimate re regime of representation, but does not fundamentally transform the underlying societal relations of inequality, exploitation, and national oppression. It is a question the black student movement will need to address as it further evolves on its legitimate decolonizing mission. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I forgot to introduce myself at the start. I'm Yusuf Sayed. I'm in the Center for International Education at the University of Sussex, and I've collaborated with Robbie on this. I think we can open it up now for, and it's left us sufficient time to engage robustly with it. And if I can just start by making some observations about the talk. I mean, I think it is significant that the talk is pointing to the danger of the decolonization project as potentially eliding differences. 
but also narrowly casting itself as a narrow nationalist project, and that chauvinistic nationalism might re replace a strong identification with a more radical transformation strategy that was envisaged in 1994. I guess the question I would throw back to Robbie as is reflecting, and before I open up, is to ask why did it emerge in 2015 and 2016? What was it about the political context and the socioeconomic context in South Africa around two, three years ago that saw the emergence of the Roads Must Fall and the Fees Must Fall com campaign? And what are the organizing ideas and principles behind this if it's such a leaderless movement? Where does it draw its intellectual resources and sources from? I think it's those kinds of issues that I'd like to throw open for discussion. I also think that I want to challenge the perception of focus only on higher education because fundamentally there isn't a discussion and a debate about decolonization of schooling. And in fact, many of the student leaders in the research we've done suggest that they come from very elite private and public schools in South Africa. So the question is, what about the decolonization of schooling and the decolonization of the schooling curriculum in as much as the decolonization of higher education? And in particular, my particular pet project, what about teachers and the decolonization of teacher education? So with those remarks, which you don't have to answer at this stage, I will throw it open for discussion, and I think we'll invite a set of three or four questions and then give Robbie a chance to answer. And also, hopefully, by then we'd have some online questions and comments as well. So if you want to speak, please just raise your hands. Say, just introduce yourself and then go ahead with your question, stroke comment. Tony. Yes, I'm absolutely You need to use the mic because we need to record yes. it. And uh, this whole issue uh, which you've been um, raising about our free air and Bubi, what the Yongo in Kenya, the mm. decolonization of not only knowledge content, but knowledge of the process. I wonder whether you might like to comment on that. Uh, what what, uh, uh, what uh, impetus has there been to move from a model in which knowledge is given by an expert and is then transmitted to passive learners to one in which knowledge is const con constructed in dialogue be 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 between learners and, uh, and, uh, and the teachers. Has that transformation of curriculum process uh, been one of the issues you've been talking about? Thanks. Thanks. Any other comments, <coughs> questions? <coughs> okay, over here, and there's t two and three, so we'll take a set of three. Um, on the picture of, um, of the PowerPoint slide, there was uh, the protest, and in the background it said Marikana. Um, I was wondering how Marikana and then struggles of, of working class people in South Africa were included in the in the movement and were picked up as well in order to broaden it maybe, yeah. Okay. Let's have a question here in front as well on my right. Um, I have two quick questions. Uh, the one is about the process of renaming uh, the university currently known as Rhodes. Mm. Um, you mentioned in the presentation um, that, that there had been a, a task team but it's been disbanded. So I just wanted to know where in the process that is um, yeah, at the moment. And then the other question that I had was about uh, minimum, minimum initial payments. Um, I know that that was not necessarily something that came through the Roads Must Fall movement, but definitely mm. did through Fees Must Fall, um, mm. and, and how a lot of students and student activists saw that as a massive gatekeeping mechanism um, that Roads had, or the uh, UCAR, um, had used to keep students out at, uh, at Roads. So I was wondering where, that's, where that process is as well. I think, what, do you want to respond to this set and then we'll open it up? Okay, okay. maybe just Go for give some, some responses to... Thanks. Thanks for those questions. So, I think 
Tony, what you're pointing to is the process by which knowledge is produced and whether that's also questioned in terms of not only what's presented as valid knowledge in terms of decolonized knowledge <coughs> reflected in intellectual thinkers, black intellectual thinkers like Nugugu Watyongo, Thomas Sankara, Milka Cabral, um, but also whether there's a process of establishing a new kind of knowledge, perhaps throwing on these fonts. And that, I think, is not a question that I see very prominently on the agenda at the moment. What uh, is being engaged with is the idea that we need to create spaces for legitimating these other forms of black intellectual knowledge as valid for discussion and engagement within the university context. To proceed from there to a much more deeper process of saying, well, how do we understand someone, profound thinker for me, like Amilka Cabral in a context like South Africa and the transformation, uh, and the kinds of questions that he asked about national consciousness and transformation, and what that might mean for the current complexities of a society like South Africa is perhaps perhaps the second stage or third stage of the engagement. But I think the struggle now, as I have seen it, at least articulated on the part of the students and many academic staff, is to get these writers and thinkers on the agenda of the curriculum as a starting point. So that's, that's a response to, to, the, to, to you on that. And in terms of Marikan and working class struggles, so, I mean, the big overarching issue is the location of class within these struggles. And there's definitely an undeniably an identification through, through, in fact, the politics of identity, the affirmation of a certain form of blackness, that within that blackness, there are those who are experiencing racial discrimination, but there are also those who experience class oppression and class ex exploitation. And Marikana, in that context, becomes a potent symbol of students connecting their own struggles within the university context to the struggles of workers. But of course, students are to some degree limited by their own class positionalities. The opportunity that our education gives them to aspire to, oh, to, 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 to secure themselves into, into professional positions within the wider society, which in some respects delinks them from the struggles of workers, working class, the working class more broadly, but that is not to say that these, there's, there's not a sustained attempt to make the links, at, certainly at the symbolic level, with those social struggles. How those struggles actually get linked to in terms of struggles external to the university, worker struggles external to the university, is something that is still, I think, quite un, unrefined or un, un, unengaged with in, in a systematic way. But certainly it is identified at the symbolic level. So, work, so students will have events in solidarity with workers from Marikana. They will engage with events that affirm the struggles of black workers. In the context and perhaps the limitations of a knowledge creation institutions, how this directly then impacts on the struggles outside the university institution is, is something that's at the moment less, less clear or less clarified. And then some questions on on the struggles at Rhodes. So the process of renaming has gone through fits and starts. Um, the imperative to change the name of the institution, of course, has got a long history. It preceded the struggles in 2015. There were attempts in the 2000s to change the name of the institution. I think it's a problem of how you reconcile the changing a colonial, a, a, an institution with a colonial legacy like Rhodes University in the context where you have a dominantly white professoriate, have a dominantly white academic staff, and try to do this in terms which are understandable as a, as a knowledge creation institution, which is democratic collegial discussion and engagement. How is it that you're able to achieve that objective of renaming the institution through consensus when those who are most vested perhaps in retaining the name of Rhodes, and not necessarily one is to say with the intention of sustaining his racialized legacy, but because of uh, the historical import that they might hold to the name over the long period. How do you change that democratically? And so a lot of the imperative to transform the name, to get the debate around name change shifted, where it becomes a real debate with a real chance of transforming the name to one that is more legitimate or acceptable or relevant to the, to the 
the nature of the current society is something is reflected in the fact that there is this institutional incoherence in moving forward, in getting to a place where the, the name can be deliberated on or and changed. So the initial impracticality of bringing a high-level team from across the country, busy people, to being part of, the, uh, of a process of, of thinking through how the name could be changed was then disbanded because it just proved impractical. It was a protracted period. They could not make those commitments. And then it was shifted to the institutional forum, a statutory body, which the university uh, is obligated to establish in terms of a mandate from the government to reflect on institutional imperatives and the extent to which they've changed in the institution. And although there was a process discussed there about how the name was going to be uh, discussed in terms of the, the changing of the name or the possibility of changing the name and talk to different constituencies, the alumni and so forth, it seemed there has been some traction in speaking to some of these constituencies. But there's no final conclusion at where these sets of consultations are going to come together and how are they going to be validated in terms of the historical experience of different communities within the Rhodes, Univers within Rhodes University and how they come at that name change. So obviously black students, black academics, like myself, who would have a very different position on the, naming of the, the changing of the name of the institution given how one would view Cecil John Rhodes as a colonial racist and the imperative, therefore, to change the institution, to consider other names, perhaps Steve Biko, uh, that, that it is constantly stymied by a process which does not seem to get institutional traction. And perhaps one has to ask the question about whether the name change debate can be divorced from struggles by students, by staff, who see the necessity of transforming the institution and taking the imperative uh, away from the institutional fabric and to keep the, the, the issue of the name change alive through these, these popular struggles from below. So at the moment, it's in, it's, it's in, the, in the institutional forum and one has to still wait to hear where, where things are going to move forward in terms of shifting the, the debate on the name change. And then importantly, you point to the, min, the minimal initial payments, and that's the payment that students have to make up, up front when they come into the university. Many black students can't make that payment, but their continued access has been predicated on, on the initial payment. But there the university has gone a deal in, in addressing that by removing the, the underpinnings of the initial payment and allowing students to access the institution without the minimal initial payment being a, um, a stumbling block to entering the institution. And that's a consequence, of course, of, of many struggles that has occurred over the last two or three years to shift, to shift the agenda of payment and access. Uh, I think that's the first okay. step. Thanks. Let's open it up for more questions at the back, Mario, then in front on my left. First at the back. Uh, anybody else? Uh, talk. I wanted to ask a question about whether what you're describing is also a kind of intergenerational conflict within the left uh, in terms of a kind of young body of students emerging who are not only challenging the orthodox establishment but they're also challenging what they see as a somewhat redundant and stagnant Marxist left in South Africa because I get this kind of overtone that's not dissimilar from, you know, if you go back to 1968 and look in Paris, the difference between some of the students that were drawing pictures and, and psychoanalyzing uh, the struggle, whilst the kind of classical Marxist movements were saying, you need a party, you need an organization. And I get those kind of sense. And for me, I think that we on the left, the older generation, also have to recognize that there's something very much absent within Marxist discourse around culture and the importance of culture and the kind of embeddedness of that culture and the need to reinterrogate re it. Because my sense was when I was in South Africa during this uh, period of mobilizations of students that amongst the progressive academia in South Africa there was a kind of sense that the students are going in the wrong direction. 
they're going off and mm -hmm. we're not necessarily supporting them because they're kind of, in a sense, deviant, deviant left, you know? And I wondered mm -hmm. if, you, you know, if you mm -hmm. felt that that was part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's a big mm -hmm. discussion about the kind of white establishment, <coughs> but I also think that there's something inside the left mm -hmm. that puts its distance to some of the cultural, the re- <laughs> Um, the rebirth of Fanon and those discussions, which at least for myself I find interesting. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, in front on the left. Thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. Um, my question is one more of a curiosity which you may or may not know the answer to in specific. Um, but in terms of what Tony was talking about, the, about the production of knowledge, and Googie also talks about the the decolonization of language and the language that we use in institutions like English and how English can kind of carry that colonial narrative uh, into, into the schooling systems as well. And I was wondering in terms of the tools in which we legitimize knowledge through um, higher education, through, through journal articles and publications, um, uh, there are indexes like the Social Science Citation Index, which is very much like anecdotally associated with kind of Western knowledge production and legitimization. I was wondering during the curriculum debates and the, the scholarship uh, changes that you were making among the faculty, whether or not there were discussions around how we kind of legitimize the decolonization process of Rhodes through kind of higher education in kind of the impact that Rhodes needs to make in terms of delivering funding. And I was just wondering if there was any conversations around kind of that level of decolonization through uh, journal citation publications and the impact of higher education from Rhodes as an institution and to what extent that was a limitation to the Rhodes project. Okay. Right. Um, any other questions or oh, <coughs> right at the back there? Okay. We'll take three and then mm. okay. Um, can I? Okay. Like right here? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so the question that I wanted to ask regarding um, specific like decolonization is um, with respect, like how far when applying it, like how far do we go in terms of like um, decolonizing? Like do we go, is it transforming the, the schooling, like who gets access to the education, who gets, like who teaches it, or is it like going into curriculum? And within curriculum, like, is it just with the social sciences and the different schools of thought, or does it go even into, um, like, fields that are considered more objective and that are, like, Western-dominated, like your physical sciences and your biologies and that stuff? Um, yeah. Okay, let's take this, and then I'll open up for another round. Do you want to... Okay, thank you. Um... So, Mario, very important question and also one that is something that those of us in oh, the, the older sections or the older, I don't know how we describe ourselves, but those who are older within the left um, need to, to grapple with. I think you're right. I think the student movement are putting different questions on the table on terms they understand and in, they understand in response to the social conditions. And so the initial response of including people like myself, I, I suppose, was saying, well, we did it like this, we did it like that, and we did it like the other. And the students' very trenchant response was, well, what outcomes did it have? Because why are we still in the mess that we're finding ourselves in? Shouldn't we be looking at new kinds of tools? And that led me to think that I need to be quiet and listen to the students and how the students are framing the debate around transformation and to learn from the insights that's provided by their own observations without imposing some kind of um, supra-understanding of how this might fit into some kind of typological framework that's more understandable in terms of either Marxism, Leninism, Marxism, Trotskyism, or any other kinds of Marxist methodological framework, if one was to pose it in those particular terms. And I think that has been very helpful and one of the examples I cited was how the students framed the struggle around free fees. They were saying that we all unified as a movement to achieve these so the social goals of free fees. And we, in the first instance, are unconcerned about the fact 
that my comrade next to me fighting for free fees might be middle class, might be more affluent than myself. It's the fact that they're willing to go shoulder to shoulder to achieve the social objective that's important. And in response, in fact, curiously paradoxical, both on the right and the left, but how can you frame it in those terms? You're also giving access to resources to the wealthier. Shouldn't we be putting all the resources into those, quote unquote, who need it? But the students are not framing it in those class terms. They are saying the basis for the movement are those who cohere around the goal. So I thought that was very interesting because I'm thinking, well, should we be rethinking our notions of class and how classes are articulated in response to the imperative that these students are putting on the table? Because what they also might be saying is we're also wanting to construct a new idea of a future society. Now, it's not something that I'm comfortable with because I see class is very essential to my understanding. But perhaps they are opening up vistas of understanding that scholars need to interrogate more, uh, more determinantly in terms of understanding how in this new context are movements constituted. Can they be constituted by end goals, like, for example, free fees? And let's say, well, we're less concerned about the class basis of the participants. We're more concerned about the fact that they are participating in processes of social change and subject that to critical scrutiny and see what new possibilities might emerge that interrogate our understandings of social strata from a Weberian perspective or Marxist perspective or any other kind of perspective. So I think the students are also offering us rich questions for scholarly reflection. And so I absolutely agree it's how there's been a disjunction dialogue between the two generations about what is considered viable strategies. There's also a displacement about what is considered appropriate in terms of cultural strategy. Why Beyonce? But Beyonce is this multi-billionaire. But the students are connecting with the lemonade. There's something there that has resonance. And we need to, I think, better understand that rather than to say, well, shouldn't you be listening to Gil Scott Aaron? Because, I mean, he was saying the revolution won't be televised. You know, the white is on the moon. I mean, there's maybe some other kind of rich stuff that we can engage with. But they're saying, like, well, for us, the two are not necessarily to polar opposites. And the starting point, I think, is not to impose a narrative, but to better understand how those narratives and understanding emerges from the students. And I think for me, that's been particularly humbling and particularly enlightening in some respects in terms of what does that mean for me as a scholar then now reflecting on the kinds of issues that the students are helping to raise and to, to place on the agenda. Uh, so there's one, there was a question raised about production of scholarly knowledge and how that is systematized and whether the knowledge around decolonization is reflected in the more formal ways of publications that are published, citations and so forth, or whether there's other kinds of knowledge production that's allowing these ideas to flourish in different other forms and centers. So I think there is an emerging scholarship around the Fees Must Fall movement. There is some writing and books that have emerged um, of variable quality and, and insight. What I think for me has been slightly more disappointing is the fact that the student movement hasn't grasped the opportunity of producing new kinds of knowledge around the understanding and experience of the Fees Must Fall movement and the Rose Must Fall movement. That there seems to be a a reticence to engage more fully with knowledge production that is dissociated from the formal frameworks of knowledge dissemination. However, much more recently, and it might be on the, the fact of the exhaustion of students coming from this period of 2015, 2016, which was incredibly intense periods of mobilization, and them also having to respond to forms of intense repression and understand the dynamics of the positionality within these complex institutions and being the subject to, to a large degree, quite severe repression as well, that you are finding now an emergence and a flourishing of thinking and writing and engagement and reflection. And some of it's take, taking a published form, but I think we're seeing a new phase emerging in the student movement of attempting to better understand the period that's preceded and most importantly, what are the strategic and tactical lessons that emerged from this that can strengthen them as a movement to question, for example, the uh, rotating leadership. Does that allow for continuity in institutional forms going forward? Uh, 
Do you have one leadership center today? Tomorrow you have another. How do you sustain it into the future so that you ensure there's not these massive lulls in periods of, of mobilization? How do you consolidate it? I think these are questions that, that are being asked. So now, curiously, you're finding there is more of an emergence of, 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 of thinking, of writing, of engagement, and hopefully one will see that being expressed more widely in, in, in terms of, of documentation. <laughs> Um, there was one further question on, yeah. Yeah. was it at the back? Uh, sorry, can you just repeat the, the, could you just repeat your question again, please? I just, um, so I was just asking about like how far decolonization and transformation goes, like does it go into ah, curriculum? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So I think you asked a very important question because, of course, a lot of the discussion around decolonization has been located in the humanities, political scientists, sociologists are engaging with this issue. And it's a question of what happens to the hard sciences uh, and how do they frame themselves into this debate. And so perhaps the response to that is what one scientist working in biomedicine was saying, it's saying, look, it's not so much a question of the fact that our knowledge production doesn't allow us to engage directly with issues of decolonization. It's much more a question of our science being used for socially transformative purposes and whether the science that we're producing is relevant for the transformation concerns of our wider society. Is it contributing to transforming South African society? Is the science that we're developing contributing to new forms of knowledge that are helping uh, working class and impoverished sections of our society meet, meet, uh, meet more, uh, more meaningful, lead more meaningful lives. And so I think the framing of the question is perhaps not so much in a sense how is that knowledge per se produced in the art sciences, but for what social purpose is it being produced? And there, of course, it talks to a lot of issues about the commodification of that knowledge. Is it going to serve big capitalist industries, pharmaceutical industries, or is it meeting the healthcare needs, for example, of the local community? So maybe that's one way of reframing the contribution of the hard sciences to, to some of these imperatives around decolonization. Okay. I'm going to open it up for questions, but we've got several online questions that have come to. But I do want to make an observation, and I want everybody to come back to me on this, is the question we're not really asking is who does the decolonization of the curriculum? Who's the institution or the individual? I put this in the context that 97% of the professoriate at UCD is male and white. And this is 23 years after democracy. Now, while there's no easy association and no obvious association mm -hmm. between race, ideology, and political views, but the fact is, as Henry Garuba points out in UCT's case, and in Rhodes' case, the, the professoriate is overwhelmingly white, mm -hmm. who've been there before the end of apartheid and continue to be there, who set up the very rules of what counts as knowledge, True. and what counts as publications and where you publish. And so I think we do need to confront who does the decolonization. And UCT has the experience to draw on. They have the entire Mamdani affair in the 19, early 90s mm -hmm. where they did make an attempt and it, was, it wasn't accepted by the university. So there are antecedents to the decolonization yeah. debate. But I think it's, an, it's a challenge to the audience, but it's also a, a question to you. But let's take those questions from the online Okay, so we have two comments. Um, the first is from Olu Watoyan, who was asked if the professor could talk some more about the idea of performing poverty. And the second comment is from Mufumu, who says, I often find decolonization of education rather a complex idea. How do those advocating for it define it so that it is free from mundane academic curiosity? Okay. I think those are Good questions. Uh, I won't open it up. Let's answer these two online questions and then we'll go throw it out to the audience here. Okay. Well, I think the latter question is 
one that should actually be opened up to students because it seems to be more directed at the students than to myself, but I'll, I'll give it. So performing poverty, it's essentially a challenge to means testing. The idea that as a poor student, in order to access resources, that you have to describe the fact that you are within a certain means. And so you have to declare, to some degree, your status as a poor person. Um, and in the process, the process of undertaking the means test, that's deemed as the performance of poverty. Of course, in the British context, the classical writer on this was Richard Titmus, who himself railed against the idea of means testing, because he saw it as separating out the idea of social citizenship as an inclusive citizenship, where some citizens are defined as this category called poor, and therefore have a status that suggests that there have to be actions on the part of other citizens to free them from some form of social condition that is essentially viewed as a stigma. And he counterposed this form of selective provision to universal provision, where every citizen had the same access, the same entitlement, the same quality of services, healthcare services, income maintenance services, or education services. And some, students, some, some citizens are therefore not distinguished from their condition of poverty in accessing those services. So performing poverty is about the process of undergoing the means test, which is seen as stigmatizing, and that is what student, black students rail against in terms of the, the experience of, of the education services. Decolonizing education and how do students view this and see this as something that moves beyond what could be considered banal? Is that a mundane? Mundane. In other words, how can this be viewed as something that is part of a dynamic engagement with the nature of society and that leads to production of knowledge that transforms? the educational experience, but also perhaps more importantly, transforms the students undergoing this transformed curriculum, this decolonized curriculum, in ways that make them active agents in society when they leave the educational institution. What do they do with their decolonized knowledge? Do they choose to become corporate lawyers or do they choose to work in their local communities? I think that's a question that still remains unanswered. Because what I perceive, in my limited understanding, is that a lot of the struggles around decolonization are located within the higher education institution. The debate's not relocated within the imperatives of societal transformation. So, for example, in a country like Cuba, students are required to undertake two years or three years of national service in as a reciprocal arrangement for the accessing of free higher education. So in, in Cuba, you are a higher education student, you get free education, it's provided to by the state, but the state, state says to you, hey, as a reciprocal act, we require you to work for two or three years in an underserved area of Cuba to provide social services, to provide any forms of social provision that are seen as necessary for the imperatives and needs of the wider society. But we find in the decolonization debate up until this point that it doesn't extend beyond access to the educational institution and the content of the education within the educational institution. And I think for me that is how one could dynamize the debate of saying is decolonization knowledge for this purposes of wider societal transformation and therefore what form would it take? Should students in South Africa who receive free fees and a decolonized education also be required to do, like in Cuba, two or three years of national service in the interests of the, of the wider society? I'll say there's a question, and maybe that will help to dynamize the reciprocal relationships. Okay. Open it up for questions. I've got one, two, three, four. I'll take a set of four, and if this fifth one I notice that. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Fanikak. Uh, I'm very interested in your experience of Cuba. Uh, I had no idea that uh, people did social service. So I have um, two, one very quick, uh, which is um, 
uh, is, is, are, are people, are the students happy? Oh, are they paid for doing their national service? Okay. And I would imagine, I may be wrong, that the, um, the curriculum in Cuba is, is decolonized. Um, if it is, uh, how was, how did that happen? Okay. Mm. Second question, then your mouth, but at the back behind your mouth. Thank you very much, Professor. I would like to know how the middle class is positioned and engaged in this transformation and decolonization process. Thanks. Mo? Um, two quick questions. Presumably there's a range of views amongst the students. Um, how much support is there, for example, for the view that the, uh, you, you, you shouldn't have a means test and therefore the middle class students will be exempt from fee paying because that <coughs> is it a contested issue. Mm. And has there been at Rhodes, as there has been at uh, UCT and WITS, a lot of disruption on the campus, for example, of teaching and of uh, writing exams? And insofar as there has, again, what has been the response and range of views amongst the students and also amongst the staff who, on the whole, have supported the students? Last one, Anna. Hi, so my question is about um, language, actually. And yeah. so if you're talking about um, sort of the symbolic nature and power of language, I mean, um, you know, Rhodes is obviously English, and um, you're talking about an Anglophone university. And so at what point is there this tension? What is the response to the tension between wanting to decolonize the language of the university and transform it from being Anglophone to um, the native language in the area, which I'm understanding is Tosa, um, to like also not being exclusionary and becoming xenophobic not necessarily xenophobic, but um, sort of flaring up. I know during this time there's also a lot of xenophobic attacks happening that are sort of separate, but it's sometimes sort of flared up as a result, I guess, or um, instigated by the protests at the time, um, of then if you change language, it becoming exclusionary to students who are from other parts of Africa who are coming to South Africa to study, um, who might be Anglophone or Francophone. So if you could just maybe speak on that tension a little bit and what you do about it necessarily. Over to you. Okay. Um, who have questions on, on Cuba? So, in Cuba, the students undertake the national service and it's not remunerated. It's seen as a reciprocal exchange for the fact of their free education. Of course, in Cuba, the system of remuneration for academic staff is also demonetized. So, Professors, academics earn something like thirty, forty dollars a month. Uh, the conception of remuneration is not structured around yeah. the status distinctions and so forth. Um, and the colonization of the education system. So, of course, Cuba had a revolution in 1959, and the, uh, the revolutionary movement that came to power reconceptualized the role of higher education in relation to specific forms, uh, to specific social needs, uh, privileging, for example, uh, science as needing to be directed at solving problems of uh, uh, increasing the uh, sugar uh, uh, industry, to improve uh, farming techniques, uh, to support the agrarian reforms. And so knowledge production is geared towards key social problems that are identified as in relation to, to developing the revolutionary project, so to speak. And of course, Cuba has invested intensively in medical training. So it's got thousands of medical schools across the country. And also, and I think is an element of the decolonization of the education, which Cuba points to quite uniquely, it sees its model of decolonization as not limited to Cuba itself, but one that is 
uh, responsive to the needs of the developing world or the third world. So you have many doctors from countries in Africa undertaking their training in Cuban medical schools, purposefully undertaken by the, the government of Cuba with the intention of supporting the projects of social transformation in those societies. So it's in some ways an international model of social solidarity. How are the middle class students, did you ask, engaged in the project of, of decolonization? Well, I think there for me, again, interestingly, what I observe in the Rhodes experience is that middle class students, at least black middle class students, and many, many socially interested white students are fully excited and engaged in the project around understanding the university, the institution, the university as an institution in the context of the wider society, and the imperatives to transform the institution from the symbolism of its colonial past. And I, to some degree, at least with my own black students, don't see a distinction with, from them in, term, in class terms in how they participate in trying to understand the decolonization project so I think it opens up questions about why, how one understands class in relation to some of these concerns around education, educational change, and maybe moving away from these fixed bounded class-based categories and how knowledge is produced within that, that, that educational context. Uh, student support for means testing. So, in a home observation would be that students have a sympathy for students, for the other students, poorer students who are saying we don't want to be subjected to means testing. I think there's a sympathy for saying we need to eradicate forms of behavior or rituals that are required that are considered degrading or demeaning. And so my observation is that there is not a hostility to eradicating that means test if by implication the concern is that middle class students would be saying, well, we have to absorb the payment or the costs for these students, these poorer students, in terms of their differentiated ability to access education. I, I don't myself observe a concern on the part of middle class students on that basis. Um, is there a the response of staff and students to do some of your second question. Has there been much disruption? Ah, yes, to disruption. And, and what has been the response? <coughs> the range of views is really, amongst the students, is really what I'm trying to understand. So, of course, you have a mixed student body, so how some students might become at the attempts to disrupt the institution as opposed to other students who just want to, for various reasons, undertake the academic activity, who uh, could be described either as apolitical or whatever positionality they might hold in terms of the student protests and want to be left alone to undertake the academic activity, or obviously are finding themselves on the other end of the spectrum from those who are mobilized to transform the institution from their own positionality, either as black students who are observing um, that the institution is not welcoming to them, or it's not accepting of them, and needing to act on that, or any direct experiences within the institution of either racism and so forth, and therefore needing to engage in some form of agential action to transform that condition. And so it's a difficult, it's a difficult question to, to reconcile in terms of the complexity of the student body. But as a whole, you'll find that within the black student sector, there is an attempt to, uh, to, to, to engage with the issues of disruption and saying, well, why are we needing to disrupt? Because we want to transform the institution and we want to transform it with a greater sense of urgency than what is displayed. And there's a part of other students who are saying, well, we want to continue our academic activity. And we've, obviously, the disruptive activities are allowing us to undertake that. That often can lead to forms of tension. And also, it must be admitted that within the black student movement, there are poorer students who are saying that actually this might be a limited opportunity for me to complete my education, and I can't afford to repeat the year. And that also creates further tensions. 
But I think if one was to talk about the student movement as a whole, the students are sympathetic to the idea of transforming the institution and the specific tactics and how they articulated are the ones that are subjected to constant scrutiny in terms of the differentiated student experience with white students, perhaps in, to some degree cushioned from the realities of South African social life and what that means for black students, being far more at a distance to some extent to those who are willing to support uh, disruption as a mechanism for achieving change. And of course disruption is used not just in terms of physical disruption, but is also meant as pedagogical disruption. Changing the way things are taught, changing the way knowledge is produced is also seen as forms of disruption when students are demanding that Fanon get taught in the class or that Thomas Sankara and his thinking gets taught in this class. That is also seen as a mode of disruption of the, the status quo in, in, in the institution. Uh, the question about language and ah, the question yes, about the, xenophobia and its relationship okay. to the student protest. <clears throat> so, important question, how do you reconcile uh, the shifting away from an Anglophone speaking language culture but in, the way, in ways that doesn't allow for the emergence of agendas of narrow nationalism codified in language and which suggests that students from outside South Africa who may speak French or another language are not welcome. And how does one reconcile that? Well, I don't think language for myself is the issue. It's how do you institutionalize meaningful dialogue across student communities and in fact allow language not to be a barrier. Even the existence of different languages to be welcoming of a diversity of language use, but within that create mechanisms for constant dialogue between different language communities and different student groupings. And there we have had an international office who's with, with great determination has tried to create an environment where students from, which, from whichever language source feel that they are welcome in the institution and that one language is not reified over, over any other. So I think it's the mechanisms that we put in place to allow dialogue among students across their language groups that's more important rather than the reification of one or other particular language. Because language in itself, of course, is a, me is a mechanism of communication and could be used for reactionary purposes or could be useful for progressive purposes. Thanks. Okay. okay, we have time for one or two last questions and then we'll try to wrap up. There's one over there and anybody else? <coughs> Have the question. One right at the back, Kate. So we'll take those two, and if there's anybody else, please let me know. Thank you for your lecture. I saw, as you said, many like white students, non-black students, were also engaging with these activities. And sure. in the context of decolonization or these movements by young generation in South Africa, quite diverse and mixed society. How do you place their identity as, for example, like black, and their identity as South African, I mean South African student? How is it related to and how like each influence these movements? I don't think I quite got Thanks. that. The question is, how do you relate the assertion of identities as South Africans and identities as black or white? Okay. okay. Uh, Kate, back. Thank you. Um, just, I was just wondering how gender fits into all of this. I think you mentioned it at the beginning, but I just wondered, and apologies if I missed you saying something more about it. But if you could say, you know, what, because presumably these weren't only kind of white institutions of white power, they're also institutions of male power. So how is that being challenged within this process of decolonization? Thank you. So that's expressions of male power, okay. Gender. Gender. How does gender feature in mm. debates? Let's state okay. that question over there. Uh, yeah, thank you for your really interesting um, lecture. Um, 
Maybe it would be interesting if you, and I don't know if you can. Yeah, thank you for your rhythm. <laughs> okay. Um, if you, I, I'm just wondering as a school of development studies um, <clears throat> that is in Britain, which is a former colonial power uh, that still studies under research many of the former colonies of Britain uh, and uh, still charges international students significantly more um, so that school students coming from uh, developing countries are paying significantly higher fees. Um, and a whole whack of other colonial practices that I would say we also have at IDS. Um, it would be interesting to hear if you could pro provide some suggestions on what we at IDS can learn from uh, the movements for decolonization uh, at the university formerly known as Rhodes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's, are there any last questions? I think let's take mm -hmm. these questions and then head towards wrapping up. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, South African identity as opposed to identities expressed through blackness or through whiteness, I think the question is important because in fact, what it reveals is the lack of movement in South Africa about achieving a singular national identity as South Africa, while there are still these profound underlying inequalities which are racially and class-based, which in some respects force people into positionalities of blackness and whiteness to reflect the emancipatory objectives, to reflect the emancipatory objective, uh, ideals and of course within whiteness, whiteness being a signifier for something that's oppressive and exploitative and undermining and something that's reflected in people's continuing uh, experience of, of privilege which have these colonial roots. So my response to that, that we'll get a South African identity once we can deal with these fundamental underlying inequalities that are sourced in our colonial history the issue of land dispossession, uh, the, the issue of, of social alienation because of consequent of people's experience of apartheid and the unaddressed concerns about that that still bedevils our, our current society. That we need to deal with those fundamental inequalities and it's only when we're able to deal with those fundamental inequalities that we can even raise the prospect of a more inclusive South African identity. And I think that's just the the bitter lesson of, of where we're at as a society at the moment. Uh, gender, now so gender features in fact very, very prominently in the decolonization debate, uh, particularly the affirmation of sexual identities and moving away from what's described as heteronormativity, very, very prominent in, in the discussions. The assertion of the, the, the leadership of particularly black women in this leadership movement, and some of the most prominent leaders have been black women. And within that, an interrogation of sexual abuse also within the student movement and confronting that, of saying that this is not a movement that is necessarily unified in all respects, that there are underlying concerns around gender that are unaddressed. And so that even within the black student movement, that men and women don't participate equally in the context of unresolved issues of sexuality and gender. So I think all these issues are coming to the fore very prominently. And for me, what is most, um, what I take a lot of courage from is that black women are being very militant and uncompromising about this, uncompromising about any sexual abuse that they are seeing and reasserting their right to have this dealt with in, a, in, a, in an unmediated way. Uh, so I think that the issue of sexuality and gender identity is very prominent in this, and it's still to some extent unresolved because of course it reflects under, underlying relations of patriarchy that remain unresolved in the wider society, not just in South African society, but all, all societies. Whew. The lessons for IDS from UCA. Um, I have to be very careful here because I'm the guest of IDS, of course. Um, um, and you are being recorded. I am being recorded. Um, 
I think more positively, there are a number of, of lessons that can be undertaken. I think I would want to respond to this primarily, though, as a scholar, and to ask the question, to what extent does the intellectual agenda of IDS, and I have no reason to doubt that it may or may not be the case, does it reflect thinkers who come from an experience that are outside a particular Eurocentric or Anglocentric worldview? Um, to what extent is IDS engaging with the thinking of Milka Cabral or Thomas Sankara as particular figures who provide insights on agendas of social change in, say, for example, African society? And how meaningfully is that engaged with? And what insights does it provide for the policy agenda or not? Not so much these particular figures, but the kinds of unanswered questions that are represented by their writing in a particular period in, in African history before this was displaced by the, the, the agenda of structural adjustment, which enforced a particular policy agenda, marketization, which displaced social arrangements, uh, which attempted at universal provision of health and education, and which people like Samora Mashal, Thomas Sankara, Milka Cabral were at the forefront of putting forward as an em emancipatory alternatives. So that would be one of the things that I'd be perhaps asking IDS how, at this particular point where there is a need for historical reflection, to what extent is that historical reflection going on in the experience of some of these earlier writers and how are they influencing their thinking? And perhaps there are some insights that are provided through engaging with these revolutionary thinkers that might shape the research agenda in very particular kinds of ways that are more okay. transformative. Thanks. Thanks. I think we'll try to draw this to a uh, close now. I just want to, in conclude, thank Professor Van Nickel because I think he raised three questions, and I'll try to answer one of the ones just posed now. One is that decolonization is not a unified, homogenous movement in South Africa. It's full of tensions and contradictions. And amongst its contradictions is why it takes place predominantly at historically white universities when the historically disadvantaged universities are less impacted or differentially impacted mm. by decolonization. Because I think it emerges in the context in answering partly my own question is that, you know, the one thing about South Africa 23 years later is that it's more unequal than it's ever been at any single moment in time. Then it's still segmented. The social experience of South Africans are physically segmented. So, and, the state is hardly, in end, by any stretch of the imagination, largely redistributive. So I think decolonization is symptomatic of wider structural, historic, and embedded inequalities in society. And that is why I think you can also note, and it's significant, there are more strikes and municipal protests at any point in South African history than ever before. And so decolonization doesn't emerge in a vacuum. It emerges in a constellation of socioeconomic challenges which are rooted in the post-apartheid economic trajectory which is less than equal. But I think decolonization does speak back to UK experience and I think it speaks back to the field of development studies in very profound ways. And there are three ways we can ask the question, who does the teaching of development studies in the UK or in any field? Who are the people who are teaching it? What are they exactly teaching? And in what ways does it become less of a development industry and an attempt to secure resources through grants and other things? And to what extent does it become a genuine effort to bridge the divide between the global north and south? I also think decolonization speaks very directly in another way. Inequality within the global north is increasing. I think it's as much about focusing on growing inequalities within UK or US as much as it's about inequalities in the global south. So I think Professor Van Nieker has certainly offered us lots of insights and challenges. And I think we do need to question the kind of development studies we're exposed to in terms of who does it, how it's done, what knowledge is affirmed, or what knowledge is delegitimated. And I think it's this kind of conversation. That's why I think in the visual you saw, it wasn't about decolonizing roads, it also was tagged Black Lives Matter. It was a sense that the global forms of inequality, while the debate, the struggles may be local, inequality is also global.
It's also within and between nations as much as it's only in particular context. So thank you for stimulating. Thank you for coming and thank you for our online uh, people who engage and for the support we've received from ideas. Thank you, thank you both for... Thank you.